data in the sales and distribution document. Okay, so let's say this is a sales order, for example, just to make it concrete. So it's an order. And of course, there's a lot of information that is pulled up from various master data for the sales order. Right, so customer information, obviously, is going to come from customer master. Material information is going to get pulled up from the material master. Um, and then this we'll see customer material info record. Just like purchasing info record. Right, in purchasing info record we said that is information about a vendor material combination. This is information about a customer material combination. Okay, so we'll see this also shortly. And then of course we'll get information about pricing from the condition master data. Right, condition in SAP stands for pricing. The reason they use the word condition is that the price will be determined by many different uh, conditions, right? Who's the customer? What's the quantity? What's the product? What is the time period? Where are we selling? Anything. It could be based on lots of different criteria. So that is why they call it as a condition master. And in fact, they use the condition technique in other places in the system as well, not just for pricing. But most of the time we encounter it uh, from a pricing context. Okay, so that is condition master, which from where the prices are pulled up, and then output master data, which defines you creating a sales document. Output master data defines how will this document be output? I mean, is it supposed to be printed? Is it supposed to be faxed? Uh, is it supposed to be emailed, etc.? Right, that defines based on yeah. It's more about how the information will be transmitted. Okay, but the point is it, it can get complex. You may think well, why is that such a big deal to keep master data? You've got thousands of customers. For every customer you've got to do something different. Some customers wanted fax, some customers wanted email, some customers wanted sent by mail, etc. Okay, and also uh, the output master data defines the format that you'll be using for various documents. Right, the, the actual physical printing format that you'll use for various documents and you've got you know many many different types of documents in the SAP system so that is why all of this is controlled using the output master okay and then finally you've got control tables which define you know before you let's say start creating sales documents and so on somebody has customized your system right and in customizing they have said how certain aspects of the purchasing screen should behave Right, for example, in certain drop down lists, what exact values should come? Right, and which fee, some fields may be optional, which fields are shown, which fields are not shown, things like that. Okay, so all that is defined by the control tables. Right, so that's a little different from master data. That is how customizing is going to impact your transaction. Okay, so pricing here and then various configuration parameters which fields are shown, what are the default values. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et okay, and of course we already know that data from one sales document can be copied to other sales documents. For example, you may create a uh, you know a sales inquiry, which is just a non-legal document, just information, and then the customer comes back and says, "Yeah, I like that. Why don't you you know create an order based on that?" You can just copy all the information. So when you create a sales order, you'll say it's going to be based on that particular inquiry and all the information would get pulled up. Okay, uh, customer master, we've seen this uh, at least once or twice. So we know already that customer master is defined at three levels. Uh, the general data level, which is the client level, common information that is common across all company codes. And then some information about uh, that is stored for the customer, which is company code specific. So each company code would have different information about each customer and then of course we already saw that the third element is the sales area level information right every sales area has different information for each customer okay now partner functions are uh, see when a, you've got a customer and this customer has uh, you, you, in, a, in a sales order for example you may specify the sold to party the bill to party, the ship to party, the payer, right? Because you might be selling to somebody, the party may be one, then you might be shipping to a different party, 
right? Because that's what they may want. They may want you to ship to some other party. And then they may say you send the invoice to some place. Then, you know, and then finally some other party will pay, right? So when you say customer, there are lots of different roles that a customer may be playing in the context of a purchasing document, okay? So this partner functions, they call that as, you know, the customer being a partner, partner functions are used to define all those characteristics, right? So what are all the different roles they are playing and information relevant to those roles, okay? So that's what they say. Uh, so you've got all of these things like sold to party and so on. And partner functions is a tab on the customer master where you'll keep all of this information. And, you know, sold to party will determine which sales office it's assigned to. Uh, in the ship to party, you will have information about which is the unloading point, uh, what are the receiving hours, etc. Right. So, for example, uh, you're delivering to a particular location of a customer, but you want to know in which exact location within that whole big facility where you will deliver and what are the hours when they receive stuff. So, you should plan accordingly so that you deliver when, when they're in a position to receive it and things like that. Um, and then bill to party is things like address and, and stuff. Okay. So that's the idea. And these things four are considered as mandatory partner functions for any customer. You have to have these information, but the others are optional uh, uh, partner functions. Okay. So sold to party, ship to party, pay and bill to party are mandatory. Okay. And of course, on a particular sales order, you may say everything is the same. In fact, most of the time, that is probably what will be happening, right? That uh, sold to party, ship to party, bill to party and payer will all be the same, same party. That's fine. Okay. Material master, once again, we've seen this uh, many times already, in fact, uh, twice. And in material master, once again, you see that there's basic data kept at the client level. And then there's information at, uh, you know, relevant for purchasing and then information relevant for sales. These are all the different views in the material master that we've already seen earlier. Okay, this is customer material info record, which is just like purchasing info record, except that now we are talking about uh, the combination of customer and material instead of vendor and material. Okay. Um, now, by the way, um, when you talk about purchasing info record, okay, that is the term that is used. Sometimes in the question, if they get really sneaky, they may say vendor material info record or something. There's no such thing. Only purchasing info record. Okay. Uh, be just because there's a customer material info record, uh, you could get confused. The two have the same concept, but they're named somewhat differently. Okay. So here clearly what you're trying to say is uh, information that is specific to a combination of customer and material. It's just like purchasing info record. So here you might keep things like, uh, you know, you're selling a material to a customer. You have your own material number for that material, right? But, you know, when you ship it to the customer, it may be easier for the customer if they see their own material number there, right? They may have a different number for the material, right? So when you're sending your shipping documents and other invoices and so on, it'll be nice if you're able to refer to their, their material number as well. Things will become easier. Right. So you can keep that in the customer material info uh, info record and then pull it up and print it whenever needed. Okay. So th that kind of thing. And then of course, proposal delivery plant, which is when a delivery is being created for this customer, this is the default, which can be changed of course, but which is the plant at which it needs to be delivered for that customer that will be proposed by the system. And then any kinds of delivery arrangements that need to be made for this customer, meaning before delivery, if there is something you need to do, all of that is kept here. Okay, so this is the general idea, customer material information uh, is kept there. Okay, and other things also like the delivery tolerances for this customer, different customers may have different delivery tolerances. By, by that we mean, uh, let's say they ordered 500 pieces and you delivered 498, right, will they take it or not? Right, so what is the delivery tolerance that they have? Uh, more likely probably it will happen in uh, in bulk items. You know, you're shipping liquid with a certain volume. And of course, you know, you, you can't be exact because some things may evaporate as you ship and so on, right? So you want to make sure that uh, you understand what are the tolerances and plan accordingly. 
Okay. And the way, of course, in which a system will determine this is uh, you're creating a sales order, right? And then you mentioned a certain customer, you've mentioned a certain material. The system can then go and check, is there a customer material info record for this combination? If so, it's going to pull up that information. If not, of course, there's nothing to be pulled up. Okay. Output master data, we already spoke about this briefly. It determines how uh, what mechanism is going to be used to send the output of a particular sales and distribution document, right? So uh, it is determined, they say that this uses the so-called condition technique, which means uh, the condition is defined by all of these things, right? What is the output type? Meaning in this example, you see output type is order confirmation, right? Another thing could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, a delivery document that you're intimating them that a delivery is going to be coming things like that okay so those are all the output type defines what is it that you're sending to them okay a partner function okay for example output type is uh, you know output is sent for various sales and distribution document and like i said earlier it works using the condition technique meaning the system is going to look at all the con various combinations and then determine what parameters to use Right? So, for example, it will be based on uh, output type, which is a quotation or order confirmation, invoice, uh, etc., or a request for quotation, things like that. Partner function is, you know, you're sending to what kind of a role, you know, build to a party, ship to a party, etc. Uh, and then what method to use for output, which is printer, etc., uh, etc. Et okay, time, that is at what time should this output occur? At the time you save the document, or should it occur, uh, you know, in some, some other specially determined time? You, know, you might have a batch run in which you do this, or you manually kick it off, whatever it is, right? And of course, the language itself. So, based on all these conditions, the system actually determines exactly what to do with that document, how to communicate that document to the intended party. Okay, so that's where the condition, uh, the output master data comes into play in how exactly the information is communicated. Okay, so it uses things like what is a medium, what is a format, all kinds of things. Okay, and all these layouts are all defined separately within the SAP system and uh, you define these layouts using what is called uh, as a form which is created using an SAP scripting language that they have for that purpose. Okay, condition master. Uh, so here we are looking at the condition master. Now, uh, condition master allows you to define all kinds of complex conditions, right? Now, normally we think of a price as one as one number, right? Many times when you ask the when you ask people where is price stored, they'll say it'll be stored in the material master, right? But that's not the case because the price varies by all kinds of scenarios, right? Consider, for example, uh, you know you have these JC Penny; they announce a sale. The sale is valid only from 10 to 12, right? So you go before 10, if they are open, the price is different, right? And if they ring it up and the clock is beyond 10 o'clock, then it's going to take that, you know, the discount price. And after 12, system is not, it's going to come up with a different price, right? So that is one situation. And let's say that JCPenney may not be having this sale in uh, all parts of the country. The sale may be applicable, let's say, only in New Jersey or it may be applicable only to one store, right? Or uh, in, in many industrial situations, you would say uh, there are quantity discounts. You know, if, the, if somebody buys more than a certain quantity, then you get a discount. Or if you say the total order value exceeds a thousand dollars, then you get a discount. Okay, so the, the point is that you could be defining prices based on all kinds of different parameters, right? Price is just not one single number. This condition master is what allows you to define price in all its glorious ways. Okay, all these different ways you can say, uh, if this is the case, this is, if the customer is this, this is this, this is this, then the price is X, it's a number. Or you might say, if all of these conditions hold, then they get a discount of 5%. Or if these conditions hold, they get a discount of $10, right? Absolute quantities, percentages, uh, or it might not be a discount, it might be the actual price itself, okay, all kinds of things. Okay. So the condition master it was, is what allows you to uh, 
you know, do, take all of those into account and determine the price. <coughs> okay. Uh, so now we look at the the order to cash process, which is the the actual flow. Take a look at the time. Okay, and uh, uh, here, of course, we are showing a simplified process where the sales order is the first step, right? But in reality, of course, there would be pre-sales activities going on as well, right? That is, before sales order is placed, we might have had a process whereby the customer sent an inquiry to us, right? The customer may have called and we created an inquiry and then based on that, we told the customer, okay, this is what we can do. The customer said, I want this product on these dates, at these quantities, what would be your price? And we've given all that information. Then the customer comes back. That's all pre-sales. The customer then may then come back and say, okay, I'm interested in going ahead. And then you can take it forward. Or alternately, the customer sent us a request for quotation, right? And our company responded to that request for quotation. And let's say the customer accepted our quotation. And then said, okay, now uh, I accept your quotation, go ahead and ship it. Right. And then we may say, okay, here's a sales order. Will there be a sales order for a return material or something as long as just giving uh, or replacing the material? In, uh, you sell the laptop. Uh, that's a whole different module called reverse logistics. You know, they have all kinds of features there. Okay. So here we are actually selling uh, afresh. Okay. So, uh, so there could be a lot of pre-sales activities going on before we start the sales process okay so it could be things like uh, even you know conducting a mail based campaign uh, maintaining contacts that's also pre sales uh, and then quotations and inquiries which we spoke about right so all of those activities might lead to us actually getting a sales order from the customer and of course on the sales order we'll specify things like who's the customer what's the material what are the various prices which are affected by the conditions and what are the schedule lines? In other words, the customer says, I want 500 units, but they may not want all the 500 units in one shot. They give you a delivery schedule and say, I want 200 units on you know, March 1st, another 150 units on uh, you know, uh, March 15th, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Right? Those are called schedule lines that the customer, uh, that's part of the uh, sales order. Right, and then information, billing information, who, who should be billed for this, which is the, you know, bill to information, right. So then the next thing for us to worry about is how can we source this, right. So in the sales order screen, you can do an availability check and see, do we have the material? Because at the time you create the sales order, you're promising a date, right. So before we promise the date, obviously, we need to verify that this promise can actually be met, right? So that is the availability check that is performed. And if possible, you may have to manufacture. If, if you don't have it in stock, if it's already in stock and it can be delivered, fine. But if it's not in stock, then you have to procure it, right? Now that procurement might be, if it's a trading good, then it might be just a question of buying it from somewhere. If it's a manufactured good, then of course it goes into the whole process of manufacturing. <coughs> you have to get the raw materials, make it, and of course, you can only promise a date, which can, uh, in which can be after all of this is done, right? <coughs> so that those are all the things that are taken care of in the availability check. And then once all that is done, sorry, uh, once all that is done, of course, you start the shipment process. So the first thing you do is to create your outbound delivery document, right? And then uh, make sure that you, you know, uh, uh, arrange for transportation and then picking, right? You have to start arranging for the transportation. You may have to do that in advance because from the time you say, I need the transportation, it might take you a week to get it, right? So even before you pick the materials, you may have to arrange for the transportation, right? So it depends on, you know, how long each of these activities takes. You may do one before the other, whatever, depends on the lead times, right? So you arrange for transportation and then of course you have to arrange for the items to be brought out of the warehouse to ship. That is a whole picking process where your inventory management is connecting with the logistics or warehouse 
uh, management system, right? So you uh, activate the picking, so it gets picked from the warehouse, then you're ready to, you know, picking could involve picking, packing, everything, getting it all ready to ship out. And then of course, you're ready to ship it out, at which point you do the goods issue, you post goods issue, right? So what, what is the significant thing that happens when you post the goods issue? Okay. Yeah, but the main thing is stock is reduced. Up to this point, the materials belong to us. At this point, it's you know it it belongs to the customer, right? That's why we are saying post goods issue. That is why our stock has gone down. If it still belongs to us, of course, stock won't go down. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, at this point, yes. Okay. So we'll see the accounting posting. So that's the idea. That ownership is transferred. Your actual stock has gone down. Uh, and then, of course, you've shipped it. Now you bill the customer and then uh, process the payment uh, in accounting. Okay. So up to this point, of course, is uh, SD. And this payment processing actually is done in accounting. Just like in purchasing. In purchasing, up to the time you invoice the customer, uh, I mean, uh, up to the time you posted the invoice, it was part of procurement. But uh, actually sending the payment went to accounting. Here actually receiving the payment goes to accounting. Everything else is part of ST. Okay, so that's the broad overall process. Uh, and of course, like I've always said with other processes, you need to know this general flow. What happens before what and things like that. Okay, so here we're just looking at a diagram which shows all the various integrations. The same, really the same diagram in a slightly different format. So you see the pre-sales related uh, documents. So it could be dealing with, uh, you know, contracts. You may have a contract with the customer, right? Or uh, there may be some kind of a scheduling agreement. That means what you've, uh, let's say, made a sale for 1000 and agreed that we're going to ship it in these uh, time periods. Or there might be this whole process of, uh, you know, inquiry, quotation, etc. Uh, things like that, right? So those are all the pre-sales activities that go on. Once all of those are complete and somehow you got to a point where you want to place an order, uh, the customer wants to place an order, so you've got the order, right? Or of course, there may not be an actual sales order. It could be just that you're delivering against an existing scheduling agreement that you've already got, which means the, you know, there's some kind of a contract in place for you to deliver. And then of course, here we are talking about the delivery process, the shipping process, where you first create an outbound delivery and then get the warehouse activities done, the transfer order, uh, transfer request and order and picking, this is the whole picking process. Uh, and then of course, the physical shipment. Uh, and then of course, along with this, there's the goods issue activity that is taking place from the warehouse. And that has an impact of, uh, you know, on financial accounting, changing the material stock account. And then once this is done, we go to the billing process, which is to bill the customer. And again, that has an impact in accounting for consciously. Okay, so, yeah. So those three, three things, transporter, shipment, and goods issue, are they have to be done in any order or you can just do them whenever you want? No, that's what I was talking about, right? The, the sequence in which you do it depends. So you're really talking about what is the sequence in which I'll do the warehouse operations and the inventory operations, right? So this uh, good transfer, I mean, the, the picking process is your warehouse operation. Right. In this case, we are first creating the delivery. Right. So because the delivery is available, you do the warehouse operations first. Right. And then you will do the posting of goods issue, the inventory operation. So you transfer and shipment first and then you do goods issue. Right. right. I mean, shipment is just, I think they are talking about readying the shipment. Right. At which point you can then load it onto a truck or something. Uh, I would say these are this is the, the sequence of these two is what you're really talking about. What is the order in which they are done? But they are optional, right? You don't need to have picking in every. You don't need to have the process picking in every organization or the company. Right, 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 company. right. See if the if the storage location from which you're proposing to satisfy this order, if that storage location is attached to a warehouse number, right. then picking comes into play, not otherwise. 
remember the the connection between inventory management and warehouse management is the attachment of a storage location to a warehouse number right so if you've got a storage location that is attached to a warehouse number that means that storage location is under warehouse management right so you're you're going to ship a particular item and you say i'm going to ship it from storage location 45 of plant x right so if that storage location 45 of plant x is under warehouse management then the picking operation has to take place right otherwise there is no need for a picking operation okay so the pre sales activities that uh, sap supports are all of these you know maintaining customer contracts conducting mailing campaigns uh, tracking telephone inquiries um, and then of course sales inquiry and quotations Right, sales inquiry is when a customer calls and or whatever. In some fashion, the customer lets you know there's something. You create an in, uh, an inquiry document in your system, and then from that you can then convert it to a, a a sales order. Or of course, if you receive a request for quotation from the customer, then you can submit a quotation, keep track of the quotation, and the customer may come back and say, "Okay, I accept your quotation. Convert that into a sales order and take it forward." Okay, so these are all the various functionalities that. Uh, the pre-sales module of SAP supports. Okay. Now, what are some of the benefits of pre-sales? Well, if you have a pre-sales module, then you can track lost sales, right? Because you will know what are all the openings that were created and which did not result in a sales order. So those are the lost sales. If you don't have a pre-sales module and you start only from sales orders, then you really don't have an idea of what were the potential sales that we lost. Right? If you have that idea, then you can say, how can we do things better? How can we have a better conversion of leads into actual sales and things like that? Right? So that is one advantage. Uh, uh, second advantage is with pre-sales, of course, you can negotiate uh, large contracts and things like that if you have pre-sales support in your system. And third aspect is, you know, many large companies, uh, customers, they require you to have a complete documentation of the entire process. And having a pre-sales module allows you to document the whole process, not just what starts from the sales order. Right? So those are all different advantages of uh, having a pre-sales module. Okay, uh, let's do one thing. Uh, it's time for me to save this recording, otherwise the recording will become too big. So let's take a quick five-minute break. I save it and then we resume.